going to give you some extra time to do it, but let's open our Bibles to 2 Kings today and chapter 5. There's a lot to be found in uh, this passage, a lot to be found in this chapter. Uh, we're going to lay some groundwork for it, though. We're, we're talking about big questions that people ask, and one of the big questions that gets asked is, uh, why, why evil and suffering? Why does a good God allow people to to experience hurt and struggle and pain? Why, why can't he just shield us from those things? And if God does not shield us from all evil and suffering, then is he not a good God or is he not all powerful? What's, what's the breakdown in this journey? And so we're going to take that on today in the next few minutes. Isn't that, doesn't that sound like a good way to spend a day? Um, now, I recognize what I'm about to talk about is going to require something of you that you may or may not be willing to give me. And, and that is, you're going to have to really think today. And I also recognize that it's in the morning on a Sunday I took a, I took a uh, couple of years of Hebrew in seminary. I had this professor, and because of my work schedule, I was working in a warehouse where I had to be there all morning, and I worked at, all morning and then went to class in the afternoons and the evening. And uh, I had this professor taking Hebrew. Our class began at 1.15, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, his... Uh, it's Dr. Gar, Dr. D. David Garland, and he had a resonant southern drawl, and he would teach us Hebrew right after lunch at 1.15. And uh, I hope, I hope I don't lose you all as Dr. D. David Garland often lost me. But I'm going to give you some pretty heavy things, and part of this on the front end is the philosophy of religion side of this story. Uh, what the Bible says about a big sweeping topic. And then we're going to land this thing in Second Kings with some really practical application. And if I've lost you along the way, I'll alert you to the fact that now we're to the part that you're really going to like a lot. Okay? Not that you'll hate this part. All of you will not hate this part. Some of you will hate this part. Now that I've set a horrible expectation for you. <laughs> why evil and suffering? That's a big old question. And hardly a day goes by that we don't come across evil and suffering. There's devastation caused by earthquakes and floods and storms, and fires, uh, there are millions of people living in poverty. You know, today, if it's an average day in the world, somewhere 30,000 children are going to die of malnutrition-related disease, illness, suffering. There's abuse. There are family breakdowns. People suffer. And it's not just people. This isn't a theoretical kind of theology because we suffer. Some of you today at whatever level, whatever areas of life you suffer. And so it's, it's right to say to God, God, if you're there, why don't you do something about this? And I got plenty of things where I'm calling out for myself and I'm calling out for many of you on a daily basis for the needs in your life and for the suffering and the hurt that God can deliver. And God can deliver. But oh, there is suffering in this world. I, I began this part right, I, as I write out this my, a manuscript, sermon manuscript, got to this part, and I got interrupted, and it caused me to have to turn uh, to my calendar, and I realized I'm writing this on September the 11th. And uh, that awakened a few things. It also, in just the days prior to then, We'd had the mass shootings in El Paso and Midland, Odessa. There's a lot of suffering in the world. Now imagine if we could actually tell God what to do. And we often think what God needs is better consulting. And I think I'm just the guy to do it. I could tell God how to clean up 
the problems in this world. So if you are going to be God's consultant on evil and suffering, where would you start that conversation? Well, let's see. How about if God gets rid of the terrorists and the murderers in the world? That would, that would solve a lot of suffering in the world. Less suffering for a lot of people, but suffering wouldn't be eradicated. How about those who would abuse children or those who would be drug dealers or thieves? And we said, wow, the world's getting to be a better place all the time. But suffering is still prominent in the world. So this is still a long way from a perfect world. How about, okay, so there's all that suffering, these big sweeping things. But how about this? To really get rid of the suffering in the world, what if God gets rid of the people who are selfish? What if God eliminates all those people who are unkind to others? What if, what if God, to really get rid of suffering in the world, he, he gets rid of the liars and the gossips and, oh my. Well, it's one thing to talk about those other people that are bad out there and getting rid of them. It's another thing when we start... God's going to have to get rid of me to get rid of suffering because we cause suffering ourselves. And it's a lot of different areas. That time we lost our temper with someone, that time we trampled over someone to get what we wanted in life, when, when there was an opportunity to care for the poor, the under-resourced, the disadvantaged here or to the ends of the earth, and we just didn't care about that. That... Uh, that time we were just too tired or too busy for our kids or we gossiped about our work colleagues or we just we were tired and our words were short and sharp to some just poor soul who was working a checkout counter somewhere and we just ruined their day we cause a lot of suffering ourselves so if we demand God throw suffering out of this world we're actually demanding God throw us out of the world Sometimes the question is asked, why do bad things happen to good people? And by good people, we always mean ourselves. Why do bad things happen to good people? And uh, if you missed last week, I'll, I'll fill you in on this part of the sermon. The answer to that is, there are no good people. The Bible is quite clear. There are not good people. We are all sinners in a state of cosmic rebellion against almighty God the Bible makes it clear we are stained by sin infected by sin at the deepest levels of life the Bible says this is Romans 3 there, are, there is no one righteous not even one there's no one who understands there's no one who seeks God all have turned away all alike have become worthless there is no one who does good not even one there aren't any good people Every human being on this planet, here's what we deserve. We think, I deserve to have a problem-free life. You know what every one of us deserves according to God's word? We deserve to spend eternity in hell. And the fiery punishment forever and ever and ever. And we broke that out last week. Every second we spend alive on this earth is actually just a testimony to the mercy and grace of Almighty God who allows it in spite of of who we are and what we do. Even the most terrible misery we could experience on this planet is merciful compared to what we deserve. Eternal hell in the lake of fire. Now, a better question would be, why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? Why do you have anything good happen in your life? And that's a, that's a big sweeping. When the Bible says God proves his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, still bad people, Christ died for us. Despite the evil, the wicked, the sinful nature of people in this world, God still loves us. He loved us enough to send his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin so that our sin, it caused a lot of pain for us or for other people at all kinds of levels that ripples out in ways we can't even begin to fathom. He forgave us of our sins. He gives us the he gives us the opportunity to have a walking around relationship with him every day and the assurance of eternity forever in heaven. What we deserve is hell. What we're offered up through faith in Jesus Christ, surrendering our lives to him, is eternal life in heaven. That's a pretty amazing gift. God's way good. God's way holy.
and he's way just. Now, one of the things about this whole thing of evil and suffering is God does a lot of things in it to accomplish some big purposes. You and I were not created for time. We were created for eternity, to be with God for eternity. This life, with all of its difficulties, ever how great, ever how small, ever how devastating, however uh, simple, this life is not long, but eternity is forever and ever. And one of the things God does, he creates a dissatisfaction in our lives through the difficulties we face just to remind us this is not heaven. I've said that to you lots of times, but I think we need a reminder because we seem to th expect this is going to be heaven. This is where everything is perfect. This 70, 80, 90, 100 years, whatever God gives us here, this is where it's all going to be awesome all the time, and that is just not so. It's a broken, sinful world. But there's a place like that that's waiting for us through faith in Christ. This is not heaven. And God is interested in eternity more than time. Now, I throw this all out there. Now I'm going to do this acknowledgement. Everyone has problems. All kinds of different levels. And some, it's so hard to understand why uh, the, certain people, so many things stacked up. Today, some of you walked into the building, and if I asked you, say, hey, how you doing? And you were actually honest instead of just saying, fine, okay, good. Uh, like my old friend, uh, church I served in years ago, jumping high and bending double. I don't even know what that means, but it was, sounded really good. If I ask you, and you were honest, you'd say, well, I got some problems. There's some things that are heavy for me just now, some things that are hard for me just now. And there may be things, because uh, it's getting toward the end of the year, and there's some uncertain things that, at work. And, and it may be the things you're sure of that are difficult things at home. Maybe a combination of both. Sometimes we have flashes of hurt. Sometimes it's a long journey of difficulty, pain, problem, illness. Problems come in all sizes, shapes, but one thing of which we can be sure they will come. A lot of the problems that we face, because we live in a broken world, a sinful world, we are impacted by the sin of other people. And it, it sometimes there's things that just fall on us because we happen to live shoulder to shoulder with a lot of difficult people, a lot of broken people. This world dominated by sin and sinners, some of you are a victim of the choices of other people. I've observed this, especially more and more in recent years, there's a belief among people who are Christians, who call themselves Christians at least, and I, you know, some of them, I don't have any reason to doubt that, it's a belief that you shouldn't ever have problems if you belong to Jesus. And the biggest false teaching in the world today when it comes to Christian faith is not antichrist, it's redefined Christ and redefined Bible. And the prosperity gospel is the largest false teaching across the globe today that just says, if you follow Jesus, everything's always going to be better. It's always going to be uh, more up and to the right. Everything's going to be uh, improving all the time. Somehow, especially if you belong to Jesus, you're going to be kept from all difficulty, all hurt, all pain because God's in your life. And a lot of believers seem to think that when you experience those challenges of life, that is abnormal or it's unproductive and life begins again when those times pass. Because that's how we do it today. In the ancient world, that was not the case. In most of the world today, we... we got a team back from Guatemala who saw a part of the world where they're not surprised by problems and pain and suffering because they, they live with it every day uh, in a lot of the places we have gone in mission around the world we, we've seen firsthand uh, they're not quite so surprised by difficulty as are we in the ancient world and true for many parts of the world today one out of every five children died before they were a year old 
And that was just their world. In the ancient world, half of all children uh, died before the 10th birthday. In many countries where I have been, uh, those numbers still hold up. So they just knew more about suffering than we tend, tend to uh, in our modern world here. The Greek Stoics said about life, and again, this is written, the old, your, your New Testament is written in a lot of that backdrop. They said life is about developing the kind of character that can bear suffering without complaint. That will resign itself that this is reality and I'm, I'm, I can curse the darkness so I can figure out how to manage through the difficulties that I experience. I used this story uh, in a sermon about parenting years ago. You remember very little probably of what I ever say. But this story, some of you, it, you'll remember, this is probably seven years ago. It's about a, one of these Greek Stoics named Epictetus. It's a fascinating bird. Here's what he said. What harm is there while you're kissing your child at night, at, uh, kissing your child at bed at night to murmur softly as you kiss them goodnight? Tomorrow you will die. I don't know what bedtime rituals were like for you growing up, but I'm not too keen on a Pictetus putting me to bed at night. Tomorrow you will die. But he's just saying that's the kind of world in which we live. And these parents and the parents that I have experienced today that have lost multiple children uh, uh, around the world because there's just no safe, safety net at all. There's no hospital to take them to, all those things. These parents, they love their children too. They, they hurt and they cried like we do in the loss. They were confused and angry. But, but here's what's different about them and Western Christianity is that it didn't cause them to think there can, God can exist if this kind of stuff happens. But we hear that talk uh, often. What's different in our day is not that we suffer more. We just, we just resent it more, I think, than a lot of the rest of the world. And historically, uh, we resent it more because we suffer less than any, gen than any generation that's ever lived on the planet because of medicine, because of technology. Uh, we're in better shape than anybody's ever been. What's different is we just assume it ought to always work out, that we'll always get better that we shouldn't experience these things and we we're, we're shocked by them and we struggle against them and we think everything should be for our benefit and that we're smart enough and we have enough insurance and are enough money that we can dig our way out and we ought to be able to control it and so people in our day think uh, suffering isn't just a horrible problem but it's some kind of proof that God took a day off that God fell down on his job. The question is certainly, by the way, we're getting closer to the part you're going to like better. The question is not really will tough times come, but rather the proper question is when will those times come? And when those times come, what, what, I don't, and, and man, I'm with you on this. I always want to know why. I always want to know why did it work out this way? Why did, why did things fall this direction in my life why why and more why and even those serving the Lord with all their hearts uh, we see people who suffer have pain who die who are just they, well, boy there's some mean people in the world that I wish God had taken out a long time before he took out these really good folks why do tragedies occur around the world and sometimes we try to give answers man oh man when, when you're dealing with someone in crisis don't try to give them an answer just as a general rule it's going to come up short we like well I, probably the reason they died the reason they got sick is because oh man it's, it's, and uh, I'd like to pour some more salt in that wound if you don't mind I'd like to make it a little more difficult for you if you're okay with that we're going to fall flat in our efforts and uh, I think we get as close as we can get saying God must have a plan I believe God knows exactly what he's doing because he's God but I don't understand in Genesis we learn that we're made in the image of God and how so 
Well, among other things, God gave us a choice. The ability to choose to do what is good or what is evil, to accept him or reject him, to follow his plan or turn away from his plan. And God gave us that choice because he really wanted us to choose to love him, choose to follow him. He didn't want a bunch of robots, puppets that would just jump because uh, that's how he made them to be. He didn't want to force us to worship him, serve him, love him. He gave us a choice to love him voluntarily. You really can't say you love someone if you don't have a choice but, not, but, but to love them. So free will is uh, a blessing and sometimes it's a burden. Because sometimes we make really dumb choices and we experience the consequences of our choices. And that's a big part of what brings around suffering is there are consequences to bad choices, uh, painful consequences. If I choose to experiment with drugs and I'm addicted, I can't say, God, why would you let this happen? Because God gave me a choice and that's, that's on me. If uh, someone is sexually promiscuous, they get a disease, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not on God. That's their fault. God doesn't want us to have that kind of pain, but he does allow us to experience the consequences of our pain, partly to draw us back to himself. Not only, here's the other part, not only do you have a free will from God, but everybody else does too. That's the part that stinks. I don't mind having one. I just don't want anybody else to have one. I want everybody else to work in the box. I want to have all the freedoms. Sometimes we get hurt because of other people's bad choices. We've all been hurt by somebody at some point in life. And you probably ask yourself, why, why didn't God prevent that? Why did he keep them from doing that? Well, if he takes away their will, he's going to take yours away too. And there's the dilemma. God is delaying the day when he will deal with suffering so that we can realize partly that we're part of the problem. That conviction of sin would come to us. That we would, see, we would see our lostness, our brokenness, and our need for a Savior. And that's one of the reasons why we experience a lot of the things we do. Now that's an answer. But the Bible offers more than that. And I've, I've struggled in the past... Uh, in a variety of ways. And what I need more than answers is I really just need hope to navigate the journey. I need to know that I'm going to get through the suffering. And maybe it happens in this life and maybe it does happen all the way into eternity. But I, I have to believe God's working in it and I need to know there's something beyond the suffering phase. The amazing thing is that God knows what you're going through when you suffer. And one of the reasons is because he, he suffered too. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he, uh, he experienced the agony and the pain that sin brings to the world. That, by trusting in him who died on the cross and was raised from the dead, we can have a different kind of life. And it helps, it helps me, I know, go through suffering. Even more amazing than that is the promise that God promises one day he is going to put an end to all suffering. We talked about this last week. Our God of all things is just. And he settles accounts. And there's coming a day when everything gets settled and everything gets squared away. And nobody's getting away with anything with God. He promises that uh, this is not the perfect world, but he's promising through faith in Christ there's one waiting for us where, as it's described, there's, there's no more crying, there's no more death, no more mourning, no more pain. Those things gone forever. And Jesus died for you, for me, for anyone. And we can ask for a place in his perfect world that is to come instead of being thrown out of it forever. Now, when I'm going through suffering... Knowing God is with me is big for me. And knowing that one day I'll be with him forever, and that's big for me. Those two things give me hope. Meanwhile, this is a huge emotional subject. And I just had a few minutes to talk to you about it today. 
And I know that some of you came in here carrying a lot of pain. And man, I just, I don't want to minimize it. I, I don't want to rationalize it away. But many of you have been in situations or you are in that spot today where you, you just wonder, is God even aware of what's going on in my life right now? Does he have any idea what I'm feeling, what I'm going through? Does, does he care? And what could he possibly be up to in this? You know, I told the story a while back, you know, just by myself with you know, a few thousand people I didn't know in an airport in Dubai at 2 o'clock in the morning sitting by myself scrambling to try to get back to save what, what could be saved of my right eye through an emergency surgery and that many thousand miles from home to do it. And I, God, why? What is going on? And I do not understand this. Maybe the circumstances today are so dismal that maybe you're not even sure there's a God. You're in pain. You don't see an end to the pain. And you can't see the purpose in the pain. Some of that's the situation in 2 Kings 5. And this is an interesting story to me. One of my favorite. I love this section of 2 Kings. And because of the great stories. And this story in 2 Kings 5 is a story about two sufferers. One is a powerful guy named Naaman, and the other is an anonymous little girl. And we're going to answer uh, some of the big questions wrapped around what is God doing in my pain? Because this is what I want you to know with what you're going through. If you look to Christ, nothing gets wasted in God's economy. God doesn't waste anything you go through to accomplish His eternal purpose in you and around you. So, why has some answers in God's Word. I want to read this to you. And it's a, it's a fairly long passage. It's a great story. Naaman, commander. This is chapter 5, verse 1. Commander of the army for the king of Aram. This is Syria. Was a man important to his master, highly respected, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was a valiant warrior, but he had a skin disease. Uh, some translations will spell it out, leprosy. Aram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel a young girl who served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who's in Samaria, he could cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Therefore, the king of Aram said, go and I'll send a letter with you to the king of Israel. So he went and took with him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, 10 sets of clothing, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel. And it read, when this letter comes to you, note that I have sent you my servant Naaman for you to cure him of his skin disease. Uh, my translation from that Hebrew class I took those years ago, verse 7, the king of Israel freaked out. He read the letter and he tore his clothes. He said, am I God killing and giving life that this man expects me to cure a man of his, his skin disease? Recognize it. He's just picking a fight with me. There weren't any good kings in Israel, uh, the northern king of Israel, as you recall. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn... I'm glad there's an Elisha in this story. The man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Have him come to me, and he will know there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elijah's house. Elisha sent him a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your skin will be restored, and you will be clean. Well, Naaman got angry, and he left, saying, I was telling myself it will surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord as God, wave his hand over the place, cure the skin disease. Aren't Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? He just turned and left in a rage. But his servants approached him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more should you do it when he only tells you, wash and be clean. 
So Naaman went down, dipped himself in the Jordan seven times according to the command of the man of God. Then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy, and he was clean. Two things here. God, in your pain, and all of you have it at some level today, likely, God uses your pain to bring you to himself. What if God had a much bigger purpose in your pain than you could ever imagine? Naaman had been this incredibly powerful general. He's an influential guy. He has it all together. Everything is success all the time. He's famous. He's powerful. He's uh, the king's right-hand man. And then one day he wakes up and he has leprosy. Just probably just a spot at first. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe the gods of Syria can, can take it away. But suddenly this guy who has it all together, and many of us have had those kind of days where you think, hey, I'm, I'm, I, I can do anything. I can, nothing's going to stop me. And then, and then you have that day when you realize how fragile you are and how fleeting everything can be. What if God was trying to say to you today in your pain, what, what if the big problem in your life was put there by God to wake you up? And well, we see this all the time. People who are far from God, people who uh, have drifted from God, and God brings things to bear in their life that just, I'm, I'm, I'm flat-footed on this one. There's no place to go. There's nothing I can do. I can't help myself. I'm in desperate need of of God and God uses some of the difficulties in our lives to awaken parts of us that are sleepy toward the things of God what if God in your pain had something for you that was better than a cure that's what we ask of uh, good old Naaman uh, he thinks a cure is the greatest thing he needs God had something even better what if this thing was so valuable that after you found it, you wouldn't even think to mention the healing? Because that's what happened with Naaman. Naaman eventually, he dips in the Jordan seven times. He's healed of his leprosy. And the first thing he says when he's healed is not, Woohoo, leprosy free. I'm all clear. The first thing he says is, Now I know there is a God in Israel. That's what stood out in his mind. Naaman wanted God to give him healing. God wanted to give Naaman a big, bold glimpse of how big he was. And that glimpse, not the healing, is what left Naaman just stunned by this whole experience. The point of Naaman's story isn't that every leper will be healed. The point is to show us that God pursues sinners. And then we have a need to recognize the pain in our lives is God's appointed, merciful spot of leprosy, revealing we're just not as together as we thought we were, not as self-sufficient as we believed we might be. It could be a physical pain. It could be a fear that just has you stuck. It could be a habit you can't break, a problem in, in family. But whatever it is, that spot could be pointing to the deeper problem because the deeper problem for everybody is a separation from God because of our sin and our need for a Savior. And if that pain, if that pain can awaken that part of you that is so cold toward the things of God, the deeper soul problem, it is absolutely worth it. That's Naaman's story. Now, second thing. God uses your pain to bring others to Him. Okay, this is the crazy part of the story. The hero of this story... The main character in this story for me is not Naaman. It is not Elisha. It's a nameless little girl. We learn in 2 Kings 5-2 that Naaman's wife, uh, she serves as her, his wife's servant. She is an Israelite. Naaman, his army, had likely all the context for that time period, what's going on during Elisha's ministry and all. They swept in. She was kidnapped, taken from her family. What was typical is she could be useful and she could be easily manipulated and useful to the, to the Syrians. And he just killed her family. So Naaman, the boss, 
has kidnapped her and killed everybody she loves in all likelihood because that's how they did it. And how would you respond to the person who had kidnapped and murdered your family and friends? Well, if it were me, I would have just danced a, a little celebration dance when I found out Naaman had leprosy. Right? Well, it's about time. I'm glad I'm here to see it. Watch him suffer slow, painful, excruciating death. Payday someday for good old Naaman. Revenge. Instead, what this sweet little girl says is, if only my master were with the prophet who's in Samaria, he could cure him of his skin disease. She seems to genuinely care about him. She seems remarkably to have forgiven him. This little girl gives us this incredible, she gives us a pretty incredible picture of Jesus. She suffered because of Naaman's sin. And her suffering became the means of his salvation. How about that little picture? If she had not been in this situation, Naaman never would have known there was a man of God, a prophet, Elisha. The church follows Jesus' footsteps here. And like this little girl and like Jesus, God uses our suffering to bring others to him. As the Apostle Paul said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Paul knew a lot about suffering. And I'm completing in my... Okay, be very careful of that verse. I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body. That is the church. What is lacking in Christ's... What was lacking at the cross? Jesus said it's finished. It's all done. Everything's paid that needs to be paid. What could be still lacking in this story? Jesus paid the full price for our sin. But Paul knew this, that it wouldn't matter if Jesus died for your sins, for people's sins, for others' sins, if they never heard about it. The work of salvation may be finished, but the work of the gospel is not. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions is the tangible expression of Jesus' sufferings. We bear the wounds of Christ. Some of your greatest difficulties, people are watching you all the time, Christ followers. And your greatest testimony is not just that the Bible is true, but that a relationship to God will carry you through anything. That this plan of God's works in real life situations. And it's a powerful part of who you are. Don't waste your wounds. Are you willing to take on wounds so that other people can come to know Jesus? And maybe that's, uh, I'm sick and I'm giving testimony to it. I've seen a lot of you, I've seen, I, I make a lot of hospital visits and I've seen so many great stories, heard so many great stories, observed so many great things of people, people sharing Christ with everybody who walks in that room, the constant parade of people who come through a hospital room uh, that work at the hospital getting to hear about Jesus. One of my favorites, the guy's gone to be with the Lord. He said, you know, I, I know I'm going to die. I just want to be sure I know Jesus. And he, he asked me to share the gospel with him again. And there wasn't a lot on the whiteboard in his room. And I took off what was there. I figured they could put it back. And I, I drew that three circles gospel presentation on the whiteboard in a hospital room. He said, yes. He said, hey, could you leave that up there? He shared that, that gospel presentation with everybody who came in the room for the next four days before he died. Uh, what could God do? Well, sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's just the, am I willing to suffer not having everything that I could ever imagine wanting so that I could be generous with God's kingdom work so that maybe people aren't hungry at Thanksgiving and Christmas, if I can have something to say about that. Or maybe, uh, maybe people on the other side of the world get to hear about Jesus who would never hear about Jesus unless I gave sacrificially there. Or maybe it, our sacrifice and our difficulties is sometimes just giving up our preferences, our time, our talents to make it possible for others to come to know Jesus. Now, 
I want to share four quick thoughts. Wow, they're going to be really quick. Four really quick thoughts. And and I'm not asking you to write these down. They're going to come out in the pastor's email. First thing in the morning with the sermon link. And uh, they'll all be spelled out for you there. If you're not on that list, uh, email me. Uh, My email is everywhere, public and uh, I'll be sure that we get you on that list. But uh, it, you get a the sermon video, just hear some things coming up this week kind of stuff. Four quick thoughts. This is from my own study of suffering and how it all works. Here's the first thing. No answer, no rationale, no philosophy, no quote from the Bible will make you feel good about the difficult things you're going through. I can, I can quote you every cheerleader verse in the scriptures, and you're going to come away and go, yeah, well, meanwhile, back at the ranch, I'm not feeling too cool about life right now. People try to do this all the time, trying to answer impossible why questions when what is most needed is love and grace and compassion and a comforting presence. I don't want to minimize or trivialize what's going on in your life or what has gone on with some kind of simplistic answer. And that's going to be true for working through, helping everyone work through what they're going through. The second thing is, I am, well, we'll keep it on this one for a minute. I'm surprised by suffering. Always. I wish I wasn't, but I am. I'm surprised when it happens to me. What happened? Where did that come from? I'm surprised when I hear about the suffering of, suffering of others. I'm always shocked that it happens. And I shouldn't be because Jesus tells us that's how the road goes. Most everyone. Jesus said in John 16, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I mean, you'll have suffering in this world. Be courageous, I've conquered the world. I've conquered the world. All through the Bible, we find a world filled with sin and conflict and troubles. Same as today. So, uh, don't don't be surprised. Second big thing is, I really like, and coming off of that verse, I really like the Christian face approach to suffering and pain. Because there's no bait and switch to it. A a lot of things that, that go forward in the name of thus saith the Lord, or religion, or around the world, they say, well, everything's getting better, and people are good, and everyone has a little bit of God inside of them, and and it's this Pollyanna view of things, and I like the biblical Christian faith because it's truthful and honest. If someone tells you, follow Jesus and you'll never have troubles, you have a false teacher, not someone who has read the Bible or believes the Bible. That person didn't get that from the Bible or from Jesus. But uh, you're going to get a whole lot of that out there in the world. But Jesus tells us we will have trials and sorrows. But again, be courageous. I've conquered the world. Third thing, God didn't create any of us to do this life in this broken world by ourselves. He created every one of us for community. And when people hurt, one of the things, it's the wrong way to go at it. We just pull back and we hide away and we don't share our, our heart. We don't say, here's, my, here's where I need God's help. Here's where I need some God's people to pray for me. But that's why the church exists, to do those kinds of things, to do those one another's together, to walk together through the difficult things we face in life. And right now, You can find meaning in suffering because of Jesus who suffered. And you can look to eternity as the final destination where it's going to be a wonderful, pain-free eternity. But I need God's people around me as I'm doing this journey to remind me of that regularly. And I need to see them lean into it too. We need each other. Fourth thing, our pain and suffering uh, doesn't make sense, doesn't have meaning. Absolutely. If you don't belong to Jesus Christ, none of it makes sense. There is no great grand purpose. The things that I've talked about, it is lost. It's misplaced. It's, and what I would say to you is you can run from God in your pain, and people do. Or you can run to Him. And I'm telling you, the benefits of running to Him are eternal. He loves you. He loves you.